We cannot experience God by pursuing something other than Him, by pursuing what the world tells us to pursue. The problem is that that's the message we, we constantly hear, isn't it, in our culture? That's uh, what is just drummed into our minds. We have grown up and live in a world that exalts the things of the world as that which should be desired. And when we conform to that expectation and we seek after the things of the world, we, some, we find that they cannot be obtained. Some will eventually discover that by God's grace, you can't get what the world promises, satisfaction, enjoyment, personal fulfillment. They can't be found in the world at all. They can only be found in relationship to God. That's where you find those things. The world can promise anything, but it cannot deliver on what it promises. Father, we are so grateful to you. You are our Lord. You're our King. You're our Redeemer, our Creator, our Maker of heaven and earth. We thank you so much for who you are and for your presence in our lives, for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Father, we are changed forever, redeemed forever because of who you are and what you have done, and we are thankful for it. Uh, as we enter into this time, thank you for the worship. Thank you for our worship leaders. Thank you for the way this church loves to sing and praise you. Lord, I thank, that, thank you that you uh, have given us your word and that, Holy Spirit, you're our teacher as we come to it. Father, we ask that you would uh, bring us into all truth. And Father, as we look into your word, I pray that you would change us. Not that we would just learn something, but that we'd be changed by what you say. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we began our study of chapter 6. That include, now, this is in the format, uh, included the covenant lawsuit. And you're thinking, some of you that maybe not weren't here, and you're thinking there's a lawsuit in the Bible. Actually, there's a number of them in the Bible. <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, the Lord brings this against His people. Last week, we ended that passage with the, the ethical mandate, is what I would call it, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Micah's admonition to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Uh, so all three of, the, of this book and the previous two that we've looked at, Amos and Hosea and now Micah, all have that one verse in each one of them, actually. That is the kind of the, the pivotal moment where he speaks to the ethics of life. Uh, Amos 5.24, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Uh, Hosea 6, uh, that God seeks steadfast love. And then 6.6, 6, and then this one in Micah 6.8. Uh, over the next two weeks, we're going to cover uh, chapter 7, two parts. And the last part on uh, the 27th of February, uh, I'll be covering a, a review of the book uh, as well as that last passage of Scripture, as we finish the final prophetic word to the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, and the first to the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, and so we look forward to that. It's, Micah is that transitional moment where the shift of emphasis in the text of Scripture goes from Israel in the north to Judah in the south. Why? Because Israel's going into exile in, a, in, uh, in Assyria, 722 B.C., now, as we return to chapter 6, let's take a moment and review the framework that we discussed last week. What makes this a lawsuit? Well, the way, if you read the chapter, you'll get it. It's, it's, it's really obvious as you read it how this takes place. Uh, God takes the role of both judge, not unexpected, and plaintiff, the one that's bringing the suit, the one that is, that is claiming damages or, or harm from the defendant, who is, of course, Judah. And the witnesses are um, the heights of the hills and the tallest mountains and the enduring foundations of the earth. In other words, he, he, he calls creation to witness to the sin of his people, and they do. Because why? They were there. They saw it. Uh, and so the defendant, of course, in the dock, as it were, is Jerusalem particularly, but Judah by extension as well. Uh, and it closed with this, with this ethical mandate. Uh, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. This is after a 
something of a discussion of what, uh, what offerings might be acceptable to Yahweh God, right? And, and even though he'd said, and the people are sitting there thinking, what about thousands of rams and thousands, tens of thousands of rivers of oil? What if we gave up the fruit of our body for the sin of our soul, our firstborn children? Would that be enough? And he says, no, that's utterly wrong. We talked about that. It's prohibited in Scripture. God never wanted that. What he wants is them. Not what they bring, who they are. What is he looking for from us today? <laughs> it, it, is, uh, it is an inadequate response to the gospel to say that God just wants us to serve him. He wants all of who we are, not what we do for him, who we are. If he has that, he has everything we do, right? He has our hands, he has our feet, he has our mind, our heart, our emotions, our will, our mouth, everything we do. But first he's got to lay hold of us. That's the hard part. We offer everything except what he really wants, which is simply ourselves, our hearts. Here the Lord cries out to the defendant, bringing the evidence of their infidelity their faithlessness to the covenant in verses 9 through 12, and he sentences them for their guilt. Now he shifts back to being the judge. He sentences them in verses 13 through 15 with a summary statement at the end, kind of a causative statement, if you will, in verse 16. Uh, Micah introduces, though, the Lord's presence. He is mostly the prosecuting attorney in this courtroom scene, but here he acts more like the bailiff. Now, what does the bailiff say in the courtroom? If you're not sure, that's a good thing. Because if, if, if you jump up and say, I can tell you exactly what the bailiff says. If you were the defendant, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, most of it. But we've all seen these TV shows, right? Lawyer shows, right? About what's happening in a courtroom. What do, when, the, when, the, when the bailiff sees the door from the judge's chamber open and the judge begins to emerge, what does he say? Or she says, all rise. You know, they got that all rise sound of their voice. He's announcing the judge. That's what he's doing in verse 9. And your translation, I hope, will have quotations at the beginning of the second half of that verse. That's where God speaks. But the first two lines that aren't in quotations, most likely, are what Micah's introducing. He's saying, in essence, all rise. Uh, the rest of the chapter beyond that point is written in the first person. It's the divine word now speaking to the people. And, but first we're going to look at what Micah says. Let's enter the text at verse 9. The voice of the Lord cries to the city. Let me just pause there. The voice of the Lord cries to the city. Now, in the text, of course, we would know, right, that that's Jerusalem. I don't think that's the, that's the interpretation. I don't think that's the only application. I think we'll see that... Uh, towards the end, that we can, we can certainly envision what the Lord would say to our city and to, if you're on live stream with us, your city, wherever that may be. Micah continues, it is sound wisdom to fear your name. The voice of the Lord returns to Jerusalem this time as a voice of truth. He's speaking truth to them. He's also warning them. Micah describes this moment with the word voice in the English. Uh, it renders the Hebrew word spelled in English Q-O-L or pronounced kol. The Lord speaks to and in a sense over Jerusalem, denouncing sin and declaring a curse over the city and its people. And you're thinking, that doesn't sound like a good and loving God, does it? Well, you've got to get used to that. God does that in Scripture. He does it frequently, actually. As he introduces the Lord, Micah also turns to the defendant and advises the people of Judah just a little bit. He counsels them to seek out the wise choice of God, to fear God, fear his name, his authority, his power, his sovereignty. And then he adds this modifier, this adjective to describe what kind of wisdom that is. You would think wisdom would be plain enough. Wouldn't you? It's wisdom to seek, you know, to fear God, to seek the Lord. 
But he's, he modifies it just a bit. He emphasizes the point by saying it's sound wisdom. It's effective wisdom. It's useful wisdom to fear the Lord, to fear his name. The psalmist prays that in Psalm 86. It's going to be my new scripture memory. Hope it's yours too. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Now, what kind of verb is that? Why would he use the word unite? Have you ever felt in your own spirit that maybe your heart was not entirely of one piece? You know what I'm saying? That there were, that there were conflicting motives, conflicting desires within your heart. Part of my flesh wants to still participate in sin and walk away from God and be disobedient to God and rebel against God, whereas the, the, the most of my heart, I hope, is wanting to desi- it desires to know God and to serve Him and to fear Him and to honor Him and to love Him. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. The good things I, I, don't, I want to do, I don't do. The bad things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. You, you get this sense of conflict in a sense, and I think that's what the psalmist is saying. Lord, I want you to unite my heart. Bring it together in wholeness, in unity, in one thought. And I want that thought to be to fear your name, O Lord. That's that's our hope and our prayer. The command to fear God is uh, all through Scripture. And, And this is not, you realize, fear. This is not a bad kind of fear. This is a good kind of fear. This isn't the fear of, uh, of a dog that's been abused, and when someone gets near them and raises a hand, they cower, right? That's not the kind of fear we're talking about. This is honoring God, fearing God, revering Him. Submitting to His righteous authority would be another way to see it. 1 Peter 2.17 uses the same phrase uh, in this little short staccato burst of instruction in 1 Peter 2.17. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You, your translation may say honor the king. The counsel of Scripture is to fear God. Over and over and over we are told to do that, to fear God. Consider Him in awe, to revere Him, to honor Him. Why? It's sound wisdom. It's the proper response, is it not, to the Almighty God? Isn't that what one would should do? To God? When we fear God, by the way, we don't need to fear anyone else. You fear Him, you don't have to be afraid of anyone else. Now, so what are we supposed to do? Well, Peter told us, right? You honor everyone. You love the brotherhood. You honor the political authority set over you. It says honor the king, honor the emperor, which, by the way, they were pretty, like, not people that you would ordinarily have wanted to honor in the Roman Empire. We're to honor them, honor others, love others, but you only fear one, God, no one else. But the unbelieving world really rejects that truth. Romans 3 is is such a powerful chapter in that book. He's he's nailing down for us, right, the the, uh, universality of sin, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He makes that case from, from, you know, in, in a series of Old Testament quotations. And he saves the most damning in, indictment for the last. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's describing the wicked, the lost, those who rebel against God, those who reject God, those who shake their fist in the face of God. What is the one defining characteristic? Is it their conduct? No, it is the fact that they do not fear Him. That's what is the, the, the foundational element of their approach to God is that they don't care. They just don't fear Him. Now the Lord speaks. Hear of the rod and of Him who appointed it. <laughs> Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful Waits, your rich men are full of violence, and your tongue is, their, their inhabitants are lies, their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Now, in the last phrase of verse 9, God speaks about judgment. That rod, it's a stick, I mean, you could picture it that way. It's a rod that one might beat someone or something with. It represents his discipline of Judah in this particular case. Isaiah 10 uses it and applies it directly to the Assyrian Empire. 
He calls them the rod of the Almighty. Right? So he, you mean God uses ungodly nations? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the time. As he will, right? It, I thought God only used righteous people. Oh, no. No, no. Balaam's donkey and everything that follows it. I mean, it's God, God uses all sorts of people, right? As he will. Uh, here, he uses uh, wicked kings uh, and emperors, and he absolutely does. So, uh, first, he, he disciplines Judah first to uh, the Assyrians in 701 BC. You remember that they, they tried to, to, to lay siege to Jerusalem and failed. But what did they succeed in? We kind of missed that point because we focus on how God held them out from Jerusalem and slayed 185,000 Assyrian warriors overnight. But they took every other fortified city in Judah, took them all. But they didn't take Jerusalem. That required the Babylonians uh, from 605 to 587 B.C. to lay siege to Jerusalem and ultimately destroy it. The people of Judah probably didn't, they either didn't believe that God uh, would ever judge them or they didn't see God's purpose and hand in the judgment that came. And I think that that's, that's probably our error as well, even in the church. I think sometimes we get so caught up in what we see, what's proximate, what's right before us, and we think we don't take the moment to look beyond the event that we're looking at to see who's behind it. God ultimately is the sovereign king of this universe, and it obeys him. And the events that we see, uh, the events of our own lives, are 100% within his control. And I, I don't think Judah necessarily understood that the way that they needed to. The witness of Scripture is clear. God brought this suffering upon the people. God brought the calamity upon Judah. That's why it says, Hear of the rod and of him, God, who appointed it. The word appoint means to, to select or to set aside for a special purpose. God was using the Assyrian nation. God was using the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, particularly in the, name, in, in the case of Babylon, to discipline his people in order, don't miss this, to bring them back to himself. This wasn't punishment. This was discipline. He's teaching through this. But, well, this really hurts. Yeah. Anybody else remember that? Your parents said, it's going to hurt you worse than it hurts me. <laughs> this, is, this discipline that can, that can come our way when we need to be disciplined, even from the Lord, right? I'm not saying it's not painful. It can be. But in the case of, of his children, it is uh, unfailingly redemptive. It is meant to bring us back to restore us. But the case for the judgment is a familiar one. It's one we've seen before. Injustice and dishonesty within, pardon me, within the covenant community. He says, can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked <clears throat> and the scant measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit? Find not guilty the man with wicked scales. With a bag of deceitful weights, uh, Micah turns to the wealthy and powerful business people of Judah and he accuses them of cheating the poor and the middle class. It was evident, perfectly clear, through the use particularly of dishonest scales and weights and measures. Uh, now in, in the United States, uh, and I think around the world, you know, there, is, there is a government agency somewhere who says, this is a pound, <laughs> this is 12 inches, it's a foot, okay, this is... There's a, there's, a, there's a ruler somewhere in America that's, that's like the definitive 12-inch ruler. I don't know where that is. But whatever that is, that didn't exist in Israel or in Judah. It was trading, if you will, was based on the honor system, which works if people are honorable. It does not work if people are not honorable. Grain merchants particularly were able to use the fact that there was no standard measure to their advantage by using heavier weights on the scale when, they're, when, the, when the customer is paying them, if they're, if they're purchasing something from the merchant, they would use a heavy weight on the scale so that the customer had to put more gold in the scale right, to balance it so they made more money that way. 
And then when they weighed out the currency, uh, or the grain, rather, with, uh, they would use an undersized, and the measure here is EPHA, E-P-H-A-H. In our culture, we would use, probably use the word bushel, something like that, a, a rather large uh, portion of grain to measure the grain to be purchased. So they would, they would, use, they would give them less than they should and charge them more than they should. So they were unfairly profiting on both ends of that transaction. And the practice was condemned in Israel by Amos and Hosea. I'll just share the Amos passage from Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Hear this, you who trample on the needy. We're just doing business. This is just normal, normal business procedure. No, you're trampling on people. Do you understand that, merchants? You are trampling on the needy, and you're bringing the poor of the land to an end. You're killing them. Saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale? Can't this Sabbath be over with? We've got, we could be making money right now. This has to end. We've got to get back to work. Instead of recognizing the value of the, of the festivals of the people and the, and the, the weekly uh, Sabbath. That we may make the ephah small and the shekel, the currency, great. And deal deceitfully with false balances that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. And to make it worse, sell the chaff with the wheat. What's chaff? Well, you know when they would scatter grain, let's pick wheat for an example, uh, in the grist mill, you know, the oxen would be dragging a sledge over it, it would be grinding in a grist mill, and you would be separating the wheat from the chaff. Well, the wheat was all of it in a sense, but the, the kernel of the wheat, the important part, the part that you ground into flour to, to make bread, and etc., you would uh, separate it from the chaff, the husk. And eventually, that chaff turned into basically dust because the oxen keeps walking over it and over it and over it. And then so we're going to sell that with the wheat. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? That seems unfair. Uh, the customer is paying for wheat. They're not paying for dust. But if you mix it in enough, it's hard to tell. So... An unscrupulous merchant would sell the chaff with the wheat. And because there wasn't really any other economic alternative for those growing the grain, they were continually cheated season after season after season. Until, as Amos says, the poor could be bought for the price of a pair of shoes. The Lord God takes notice of this falsely obtained wealth, which Micah describes as the treasures of wickedness. Can I forget any longer? Now, let me assure you, God doesn't forget anything. God forgives. Blessed be the name of the Lord for that. He forgives. But if you're thinking that God lost track of your sin, <laughs> uh, no, He doesn't, right? So he, he doesn't mean I literally, I didn't know about it. He says, what He's saying is, I'm no longer going to not hold you accountable. I'm no longer going to overlook in the sense of not being uh, forgiving uh, by not, not over, or overlooking it and not holding you to task for what you're doing. I can no longer forget the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked. There are really four uh, accusations here in these two verses. The dishonest merchants are storing up their treasures, their ill-gotten gains, if you will, from their unjust trading, hoarding the goods, the luxury goods of wealth and privilege in their homes. And the implication is that, that that very act, the saving of the wealth, is cause for judgment. But I thought we're supposed to save up. You know, doesn't Proverbs tell us to save up? Not like this. This is hoarding to the detriment of other people. You may remember back in Hosea, he talked about the wealthy in Samaria and in Israel that had these wonderful ivory inlaid pieces of furniture in their houses of hewn stone, right? And while people, uh, the, the poor they were cheating were barely able to eat that day, and all they had to sleep on was the ground in their cloak if they got the cloak back that day. He calls them to account for the injustice. The word for treasures uh, is also found in 2 Kings 24, where it speaks of the treasure, the same word is used of the treasures of the house of the Lord, 
the gold vessels, etc., that were used in the house of the Lord and the house of the king as well. They were lost in the Babylonian conquest. Their treasures, would, but whether the treasure was of, the, the, of, the, of wickedness in the house of the wicked, the, the luxury goods that they were hoarding away, or the nation's treasures, they would be lost to the Babylonians. The last three accusations have to do with the actual business transaction itself. The scant measure is that ephah basket that was too large if you were buying and too small if you were selling, mixed in with wheat chaff. And the Lord was not going to acquit or hold guiltless the man with wicked scales that can be adjusted in the merchant's favor so as to cheat the farmer, nor a bag of deceitful weights. Now, some of your translations may say two kinds of weights. That's the literal translation. But the reason that people use the word deceitful is because that's what the ultimate outcome of it was. They would, take, they would use heavy ones when they wanted to and lighter ones when they wanted to so that they would always profit from the transaction. But it was deceitful. Solomon condemns dishonesty and weights and measures in Proverbs 20, 23. He says that an unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord and false scales are not good. Deuteronomy condemns it. The law condemns it. Proverbs condemns it. It calls it an abomination. Now, I looked up that word ab abomination, and I'm thinking, that, that sounds pretty strong. There are some awful things in the Scripture that are called abominations before the Lord. This one probably, to the merchants, seemed like normal practice. That to them, I think they simply saw it as an opportunity, to, as Amos said, to make the ephah small and the shekel great. Anxious for the Sabbath to be over so trading and business could resume. The Lord closes this accusations, this list of accusations, with a description of the wealthy. He tells them, let me just describe who the wealthy of Judah are. Your rich men are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. It ought to sound familiar because we've seen it before. We saw it in Israel. We saw it in Amos and Hosea speaking to the nation in the north, the northern kingdom. Judah had a front row seat, did they not, for what happened to them? By now, they had been taken into exile, into Assyria. But that did not deter the people of Judah from this headlong rush into sin. They were instead full of violence. Now, if I were writing this, and I was finishing out the sentence, the rich men were full of... I don't think I'd put the word violence there. I think I'm, I might find some other word that I thought was more fitting. But what, what, uh, what this means is, it, they, did they reach out, strike them with a, with a sword or something like that? No, they just cheated them over and over and over and over, stealing their land sometimes when they would run up a debt and they would have to borrow money and to survive, and then they couldn't pay that money back. They would eventually take the land, which was prohibited by the law. It could not cross over tribe to tribe. What they did amounted to violence. Previous oracles talked of stealing land through legal but unethical transactions in the gates. And lying was their native language, <laughs> spoken by a deceitful tongue. Now to draw together this first portion of the text, 9 through 13, we, uh, we should return to the first line, 9 through 12. The voice of the Lord Christ to the city. In this context, the Lord is crying out, proclaiming to Jerusalem, take heed to your lives, for you must hear the one with the power to both judge and discipline you. He has examined you and found you wanting. You are wicked in your conduct, cruel in your relationships, violent in your ways, and deceitful in your words. Judah, you are entirely deserving of the judgment oracle that follows next. The judge is about to pronounce the sentence. The next passage in chapter 6 is a wonderful example of a particular type of teaching or scripture. Uh, you tend to find it in the prophetic books like this. Uh, you can also find it in the prophetic parts of historical books as well. It's uh, common in ancient cultures. Uh, Israel, of course, we, we don't, you, know, if you, you don't always get that sense when you're reading the Scripture, but Israel existed in the context of other, other nations right around them. 
and were influencing, and that Moses used one particular element of what was common in that day to frame up, if you will, the book of Deuteronomy. And it was called a suzerain treaty. Now, that's a word we don't use very often, suzerain. So if you go home today and go, I think I'm going to play Scrabble. There's a winner for you right there. <laughs> suzerain. Not only has it got a lot of letters in it, it's got a Z in it. So you can use a Z if you're stuck with a letter Z. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really useful word. It, there's, there's kings, and then there's, like, there's small kings and there's bigger kings, right, in the world. The Assyrian Empire was like the biggest king around, and they would, they would conquer other nations, and those other na- they would be the suzerain, but the other nations were called vassal states, subordinate nations that had been conquered by a larger empire, Assyria, Babylon, Rome, you know, nations like that. Uh, the Soviet Union would have been the suzerain over the socialist republics, the Soviet socialist republics before, in the, before the Cold War, right? During that period of time in world history. Old Testament scholar Dr. John Wolverd uh, describes Deuteronomy in terms of this treaty form. It approximates the structure of a suzerain treaty. Uh, it's second, tip, typical of the second millennium BC, when that suzerain made a treaty with a vassal country, the treaty contained six elements. A preamble, a historical prologue, a history of the king's dealings, the, lo- the big king, the suzerain king, with the vassal state. The third one is a general stipulation, a call for wholehearted allegiance to the king. You, you, are, you are now my possession, you are my people, and I am your king. And so they would, just an overall statement of allegiance. And then the, the, next, for, the fourth one, the next phase of this would be specific stipulations, a concrete expression, detailed laws which told the vassal state how to act in order to comply with the covenant or the, the treaty with the suzerain, with the larger king. The fifth one that was common was uh, to call divine witnesses, deities alongside to witness to the treaty. Now that's not in Deuteronomy. Why is that, Mike? Who would the Lord call to witness? <laughs> he is the only true and living God. So there's no witness that he's going to call from any false God, right, to witness to this. He just that he skips that part, and we go to the last part, which is what we see here, the blessings and the curses, the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. In Deuteronomy, we find that in uh, chapters 27 and 28. And if you read those, it is, it is like a laundry list of sorts. I mean, just thing after thing after thing that is a blessing if you, if you obey and a curse if you don't. If you look at particularly carefully at Deuteronomy 28, you'll notice a real similarity in Micah chapter 6. The name for that is a futility curse. A futility curse. That's what we find in Micah 6, and you find it in a portion of what's in Deuteronomy 28 would fit that same Description. Deuteronomy 28 is broken into two main parts. It's a really long chapter, 68 verses. The first 15 talk about the blessings for obeying. The second portion, far larger, is verse 16 all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 68. That's the curses for disobedience. God seems to emphasize that a little bit more than the blessings for the obedience. Uh, it, It promises a variety of God's curses upon the people of Israel if they fail to obey the covenant. One of those types is the futility curse. It's what we find here. Let's look at the text. Therefore I strike you, the Lord says, with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. The overall impact of the Lord's judgment, writ large, if you will, here, is caught up in that single word, desolate. The nation would suffer great desolation, brought about through both the attacks of of Assyria Uh, to the fortified cities to take those and also to attempt to take Jerusalem and the eventual Babylonian reduction of Jerusalem by siege in 587 B.C. Whoever didn't die in those two attacks, right, if in the last one in the 6th century, would be taken into exile into Babylon, hundreds of miles to the east from where Judah sits. They went into exile in Babylon for 70 years. The word echoes the opening chapter of uh, Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 7. And therefore, or there, the, the, the prophet says this, Your country, 
speaking of Jerusalem and Judah, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. In the prediction, of course, it's the, Bab- the Babylonians. Micah tells us that. Isaiah in chapter 1 does not. But after the summary statement up front, the Lord's judgment continues in detail in verse 14. You shall eat, but not be satisfied. There shall be hunger within you. You shall put away, but not preserve. What you preserve, I will give to the sword. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. Here begin the futility curses. Uh, the, uh, The names should be obvious by now, right? The names for the futility that God's people experience when they rebel against Him and His covenant. And under His judgment, they find that all of their labor, all of their work is made pointless, useless, futile, of no value. Don't forget now, God is speaking to the rich and the powerful, those for whom life appeared to be just wonderful. Even to them, He says, you will... Endure futility. Those, uh, you know, they they looked blessed, but were they really? Is my question, and I, I think the answer is no. They are not. They shall eat at least a little, but they'll never experience the sense of being filled. Now, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a place near a lot of my family, and we would go to family reunions. <laughs> Tearing up just thinking about it. <laughs> I was like twelve, right? You show up and. And if you left hungry, it's your fault because, man, there was so much to eat. There was so much food. People would just be bringing food like mad. And, and then that's when the 12-year-old discovered the dessert table. And that was all. That was all it took right there. And you get this sense of fullness. You know what I'm saying? I, I, and and there was, I, I wasn't hungry anymore. That's not happening here. You eat, but you're still hungry. You're not hungry satisfied by what you ate. It carries the idea of slow starvation, of never eating enough to not feel hungry. There would be always this nagging sense of of disquiet and of lack and of unease to your life. And even when there is more to eat, it's not enough. And if one were to try to set back or save some of that scarce food for later, it would not be preserved. That's so poignant because what did he accuse them of? Storing up, hoarding things to themselves. And now he says, you won't be able to save anything. not able to accumulate food or any other substance for themselves as they once did. They're storing up the treasures of wickedness in their homes. Those days are over. What they will try to to preserve will be destroyed. It'll be given to the sword. There's an alternate, much more chilling translation to this last verse where he says, last portion of the verse where he says, you shall put away but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You may have thought, well, how could could foodstuffs be given to the sword? The Hebrew can be translated this way. You will press toward birth, but not give birth. And what you bring to birth, I will give to the sword. That's... mm. They shall plant and sow as best they can, but each year the crop will fail perhaps from drought, as God withholds the early and late rains so needed for cultivation in Palestine. Think of the frustration and the hopelessness. It's hard being a farmer anywhere. But as this farmer sows in Judah and they're praying for the rain, right, that never comes, hoping for a bountiful harvest that never, that is desperately needed but never appears. The olives that were so valuable and essential would never result in the oil that the people depended on for everything from their diet to their skin to their economy. 
They would tread grapes into juice and then ferment the juice into wine, but never enjoy the wine. Once produced, you know, wine can spoil, so can olive oil, but, or it can be stolen, lost to thieves or to the attacks of the Assyrians or the Babylonians. For what the enemy did not take for themselves, they would destroy. They would leave nothing for the people of Judah that remained, the poorest of the land, as the Scripture says. In fact, it was, <coughs> it was even customary if a conquering empire did not wish to take the land that the vassal state had, or if they were just feeling particularly brutal, they would kill everyone or leave a few, but then they would take everything, burn what they couldn't take, and then put salt into the land so that it could never grow crops again or cultivate anything. Futility. Amos says much the same thing in chapter 5, verse 11. He also connects the judgment to the economic injustice inflicted by the wealthy in Israel against the poor. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, very difficult, very expensive, but you shall not dwell in them. You've planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. Do you recall when, the, when God brought the people into Canaan, into the promised land? What did he say? He said, you're going to get to drink wine made from vineyards you didn't plant, harvest crops you didn't sow. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. It's like walking into a furnished country, for Pete's sake. Here, the, futil the futility curse is the exact opposite. Others will come into your land, and they will take what you have prepared. You will have planted a vineyard, and you will not benefit from it. You will have planted an olive grove, and you will not benefit from it. The, the house you built, someone else will live in. The principle here is this. God will not allow us to experience His blessings from sources and methods ways and means other than himself. He's not going to let us pursue the things of the world and obtain what he has to give us. They are for him and for him alone. When we pursue his blessings, as, some would, as the world might call it, the good things of life, <clears throat> apart from him, we're going to find that it's a futile pursuit. You aren't going to be able to achieve it. You will not obtain what you're after. Solomon kind of tried that approach. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. He told us about it. Describes what he learned in that book as the vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The Hebrew word rendered vanity is hevel. The quality of having no value or significance. Futile. It's a good description. Is it not of life lived apart from God, seeking after the things of the world? We cannot experience God by pursuing something other than Him, by pursuing what the world tells us to pursue. The problem is that that's the message we, we constantly hear, isn't it, in our culture? That's uh, what is just drummed into our minds. We have grown up and live in a world that exalts the things of the world as that which should be desired. And when we conform to that expectation and we seek after the things of the world, we, some, we find that they cannot be obtained. Some will eventually discover that by God's grace, you can't get what the world promises, satisfaction, enjoyment, personal fulfillment. They can't be found in the world at all. They can only be found in relationship to God. That's where you find those things. The world can promise anything, but it cannot deliver on what it promises. To seek after that from a source other than God is to pursue futility. As the people of Israel painfully learned, there's a lot of lies in the world, aren't there? Yeah. We don't lack for lies in the world to hear, but there is a big lie. There's a lie that subsumes all other lies. And we heard it in the garden in Genesis. You can be God. 
You can have everything you want, and you do not need to follow God. God's going to hold things back from you. You just pursue your own agenda. You pursue the things of the world. You pursue what you want. You follow your own heart. There is an end to that path. That is true. There is an end to that path. Death. You aren't going to find life at the end of the path the world wants you to walk. Can I say that, church, to you clearly? That's not where that path goes. It leads to a disappointing end, one where your labor is in vain and your efforts are futile, and ultimately it's a life of hunger and thirst and dissatisfaction and loss. That's where the world's path takes you. God's justice, some would call it God's economy, ensures that when we live in a disobedience and rebellion before him, we will not experience the blessings that would be ours when we walk in obedience and in faithfulness. There is one way to experience all that God has in store for you, and it's to pursue him. You aren't going to find him by pursuing the things of the world. Haggai uh, is another one of the twelve. Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, he says this. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. (laughs) And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes in it. What a beautiful description of walking the path of the world. That's where it goes. But it begins, understanding that, begins with this, considering your ways. Some of you, I can tell, are wearing glasses. No judgment here. I wear glasses. But when I do, you know what I do? I, I, I find myself just kind of focusing on my world around me, right? I'm looking through them. I'm not looking at them. I'm looking through them. I don't really think about the fact that I'm look, we're looking through a pair of lenses. It takes some effort to, as it were, spiritually speaking, pull the lenses off and look at them and consider our ways to see our lives the way God sees our lives. He says, I know you think you're doing great, but you're earning wages and you're putting in a bag with holes in it. You're hungry and you've been hungry for so long that you don't really realize what it means to be full anymore. There's a difference between the adversity that comes to people who are walking with Christ. I'm I'm not going to sit here and say that everything that that happens to a believer is just perfect all the time. We all know that's not true. But let me, I will say this very clearly. When adversity and difficulty and trial and tribulation come to a believer, what is happening? God is using that to mature us, to transform us into the image of Christ. He is doing that so that he can make us more like him because you don't always become more like him in the good times, in the easy times. It's often in the adversity that we face that we learn to grow a little closer, depend a little more, walk a little more obediently with the Lord. But that's not true for the world and those in the world. For them, that life of futility is one where you just continue to try to live according to your own selfish desires in accord with the principles of the world and the flesh and the devil. Expecting somehow insanely from those life choices to find fulfillment and happiness and contentment and security. When you walk in those ways, you can expect that life is not going to go well for you. It may look like it on the outside. You, people may be wealthy for a while, but Proverbs tells us that don't set, your, don't set your mind and heart on things of wealth because they will grow, I love this phrase, grow wings and fly away. Indeed. 
Seeking that path, walking the path of the world is not where you find a sense of abiding wholeness and satisfaction. There is no sense of persistent peace. The Hebrew word shalom is probably the best word I can imagine for this that describes it. It includes the meanings of being restored and the sense of being settled and restful and whole at peace. And that all begins with the admonition, consider your ways. And the Lord now summarizes the reason behind his judgment. <clears throat> Verse 16. And it's, un- it's surprising. I don't think it's going to be what you thought it would be. You have kept the statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels, that I may make you a desolation. There's that word again. And your inhabitants a hissing that dis- disrespectful sound that was common in the culture of that day. So you shall bear the scorn of my people. Well, who are these two guys, and why do they matter in this conversation? Omri was the commander of the army of Israel. North. Yep, you heard me. This is the northern kingdom. It's divided monarchy, but he was the commander of the army, and he rose to be king. First Kings 16 uh, gives us an overview of his reign. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terza. Omri did, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. And for he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. Now, Jeroboam, you'll recall, was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And what did he do? What was his? He, he is the one that established the golden calves to be the idols for that nation. Omri walked in his ways. What's not mentioned there? unjust behavior. He focuses on idolatry. Let's look on to the next one. As idolatrous as Omri was, his son, Ahab, was worse. First Kings 16, later in the same chapter, 29 to 33, uh, some selective 29 to 30 and then 33b. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel, and Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria, the capital, 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, why does God name... And by the way, he didn't marry well either. Anybody remember Ahab's wife? Jezebel. She was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians and brought in Baal worship, and he, he, Ahab established worship centers to Baal in the capital city. Mm. So why does God name these two kings of a different country? More, I mean, the, the northern kingdom. They, these weren't even associated with Judah. What is it about them that was the cause? or the, He's pointing to them as the reason for the judgment of Judah, for following in their counsels and in their ways. God is going back to the root cause of the wrongful injustice within the community that he's already pointed out about the dishonest weights and scales and things of that nature, the, the uh, hateful abuse that was common in that day, right? He's going back to the root cause of that, and it was the sin of idolatry. Because idolatry, being in wrong relationship to the living God, setting our focus on our own false gods of wealth and desire and power and relationships results in the injustice. When we're in wrong relationship to God, we're ultimately going to be in wrong relationship to people too. If we don't know God, how is it that we're going to treat people in kindness, as he says in verse 8? To do justice, to love kindness. If you do not know the God of all creation and you're walking according to the path of the world... How are you going to do that? The answer is you don't. From whence rises injustice in the world? It is from a wrong relationship to God in the first place. It's from valuing something more highly than Him. It can be a golden calf. It could be power. It could be fame. It could be fortune or money. It could, whatever it is. Whatever that idol is for us. For Judah, they would pay a steep price for their sin. 
Time was running out for them. In fact, the choice was already made. <clears throat> but what about our city? If you're on live stream, what about your city? If the voice of the Lord were to cry to our city, to us today, what would he say? Would he speak only of condemnation as we have refused his call of repentance and forgiveness for too long? Would he pronounce over us and our land the same curses of futility which fell upon Jerusalem and Judah? Would our future look as bleak as theirs? Hopes of joy and purpose and fruitfulness lost in the chaos and confusion of prideful, arrogant, greedy sin, of self-directed lives focused on personal gain, far from any light of compassion and love. Is that what the Lord would cry over our city? Would it be words of judgment or would it be words of hope? Is there yet time? Is there yet a chance for our city, our nation, our people, for us to turn back to God? In, in 1843, a struggling writer who went on to do quite well, named Charles Dickens, wrote a novella called A Christmas Carol. You might have heard of it. One Christmas Eve, the miser, Ebenezer Scrooge, is visited by three spirits, Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come, and they show him vignettes of his life. And as the story closes, Scrooge is shown a grave, unkempt, uncared for, unknown. And a tombstone is above that grave, and he cannot bear to look at the name. And in fear and desperation, he cries out to the Spirit this question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? Our God is a sovereign God, church but he's also a merciful God. Praise his name. He's patient toward sinners, and he's patient toward his people. Amos 5, 6 says it wonderfully well. Seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord and live. Is there an antidote for the poison in our world? That's it. Seek the Lord and live. Is there yet time? Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says this. Take care, brothers. Be careful, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Is there still time? There is as long as it's called today. I, I, I don't, well, how long, Mike? I don't know. My sense is not very long, but I don't know. But I do know this. He yet tarries. And as long as it's called today... We can pray for our city. We can serve in our city. We can minister to our city. We can turn to the people that need to hear the gospel of Christ and share with them what's happened to us, how, he, how he's changed our lives. That, the, cry, the Lord's cry over the city need not yet be one of unmitigated judgment. It can yet be one of hope. But we can't waste a minute. So church, don't believe the world's lies, because that's what they are. They sound believable. We hear them all the time. And if you tell a lie long enough, it starts to sound like the truth, but that doesn't make it the truth. The truth is, seek the Lord and live. That his cry over our city would yet lead us and the lost to repentance. Let's close in prayer. Father, would you guide us and lead us, direct us by your ways to walk diligently with you. And as we do that, 
to reach out to those that don't know you yet and to bring them with and introduce them to our Savior. God, make us diligent in prayer, faithful in service, useful for your kingdom. In this city and every city in America, in this church and every Bible-preaching, God-honoring church in America, may it be so, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.